Hello audience. Welcome to the ZBI webinar week. This is Monish and I'll be hosting uh, this webinar. Uh, we had a great session by Ajay Kapra yesterday for all the people who attended that and today Shekhar and Akshay will be speaking on their topic building a modern platform with Kubernetes. Without much ado, let me just introduce all of you to the speakers and then I will hand over this mic to Shekhar and Akshay. Shekhar is the CTO at Zebia. He has 15 years of experience in technology and consulting, agile software development and various other technologies. He has also worked as a technology evangelist for Red Hat. He has authored several best selling books on technology like OpenShift Cookbook, Java Unit Testing with JUnit 5 and many others. Akshay, on the other hand, is a software architect with 14 years of product engineering experience. He drives CNCF ecosystem solutioning and initiatives for Zebia. He also recently co-presented a talk on Kubernetes in production at Kubernetes Forum Delhi and co-conducted a four hour deep dive workshop on Kubernetes at NASCOM NATC summit last year. So with that, I'll hand over uh, the mic to the experts and we can go live now. Thank you so much. Thanks, Monish, uh, for the introduction. I hope everyone can hear me. Okay. Uh, so let me start uh, this session. Uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, today, what we will be doing is uh, we will be talking about how to build a modern enterprise uh, platform using Kubernetes. Uh, we will start with a brief introduction around Kubernetes. So we'll not spend more than five minutes talking about Kubernetes just to set the stage. Uh, I think the critical part of the session will be talking about the platform mindset and the lessons. Uh, so we'll start giving you some uh, understanding about how to think about a platform because that's the key challenge here. A lot of times people want to use Kubernetes, but they don't understand what it means to run it uh, and they don't have the right mindset to run a, a complex technology like a Kubernetes. So we will help you understand that if you are on that journey. And finally, uh, Akshay will talk about our ZB approach to building a Kubernetes based platform and lessons we have learned building platform for multiple organizations. Uh, the whole point of this session is to give you our way of working and learnings that we had in our uh, experience. But again, everything is contextual here. So uh, you have to really understand the context and some things may or might not be uh, applicable to you. So take everything with a grain of salt, try to understand your context and then apply it. Uh, uh, so with technology, you really have to uh, understand the context, which is very important. Uh, so let's start. Uh, so as we can see, uh, so this is a survey done by CNCF, uh, uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Uh, so they talked about how the container utilization is going up in the enterprises. Uh, so as you can see in this chart, you can see that uh, container utilization in the production has gone up to 84%. Uh, so in 2016, when they did the first survey, it was around 23%. And now in 2016, uh, 19 or 2020, we are seeing a, a, a rate to 84 percent. So this is the same that we are also experiencing in our uh, consulting engagements or our service delivery uh, or the delivery assignments that we see. Lot and lot of organizations are going in the in the direction of containers. Uh, so it is becoming very critical. Lot of developers these days are aware about Docker, how to build a container image. And so development and test environment, we are seeing uh, more than 90% of the adoption. But the good part is that now it has moved from test and POC to the production stage. A lot of enterprises are using containers in the production. Uh, I started using containers, I think in 2013. So I was a technology evangelist at Red Hat. Uh, I was working on OpenShift at that one of time. Uh, and a lot of develop at that time also, before even Docker, there was, uh, some shape or form of the container that we had. We were building containers using the Linux technology, so there was no Docker as such, but people were still trying to use container in their environment as well. So to help everyone understand what I mean by container here, in case some of you are not aware of that. So container is a way to package your application, but the key part of that is you don't only, you not only package your uh, application, but you also package your dependencies with it. So if you are a Java developer, you're not only packaging your Java jar or war file, you're also packaging the 
Java runtime with it. It could be JRE 8, 10, 15, 14, whatever that latest JRE is. So when you talk about container, containers give you something called operating system virtualization. So you, you, you share the same underlying operating system and you run your applications on top of it. Uh, like every technology, uh, containers solve two main problems. Uh, the first problem containers solve is around the consistent environment, uh, which is that you can have the same environment in dev, QA and production because you are packaging the dependencies along with it. So you will not be surprised that you don't have, you have a different Java version in your production environment than the one you are using in the development. So they do that. And because of that, they also give you the way to do the repeatable deployment. So any, uh, so you build the image once and then you deploy the same image to different environments. So that's the two key aspects that, two key problems that containers solve. And I think that is why containers have become mainstream because they are solving the real problems. And just to give you some technical detail around that, so container is not something new. Uh, so containers in some shape or form exist from 1980s. So 1980, we have something called CH root, then we have Solaris zones. In 2008, Linux added namespace and C groups, which allows you to uh, build containers. And in 2013, Docker made it mainstream by giving an easier way to use containers. So container used two main features of Linux. Uh, the one is the namespace, which tell what a process can see, like network or file system. The second is C group, which tell what a process can use, like how much memory, how much CPU. So these are the two main key aspects of a container. But containers alone are not sufficient. So 2013, we had Docker, but Docker alone was not sufficient uh, because Docker can only run a process on a machine. So there are more things that you have to do beyond containers, and those are the bigger problems. Uh, the problems here, the first problem is around scheduling. Uh, so like in an ideal environment, you will have multiple nodes where your containers will be running. How will you decide which container runs on which host or which machine. So you need to solve that problem called scheduling. Then there's something called affinity and non-affinity. So which means that uh, you want to say that this container should run on uh, host ABC and this container can run on host D and D. So you need that kind of a capability. So that uh, Docker itself was not providing. So we need a other solution. Health monitoring, whether my application is up or down. If my application is down, what to do? So you need to have that monitoring. You need to have a way to handle the failover. It could be as simple as restarting your application, but you need to have different strategies around that. Then you need to think about scaling. So you will never have only three instances of your process. You might want to have 10 instances or you might want to go down to one. Fine. So you need to have a way to scale up and down. So that's the horizontal scalability comes into picture. And you have to understand the networking aspect of it, how your one container can talk to the other container. Uh, now, in most of the applications we build these days, we have an application which talks to a database. Now, how does an application know where database is running? You don't want to hard code the URLs because they might change. So service discovery is required to discover the different services. And finally, you want to make sure that how you upgrade your application. So this is the deployment process where whether you want to have a blue green deployment or a rolling upgrade. So you really need to have a lot of things to consider once you have containers. So now that we know that there are a lot of other aspects apart from container, uh, so Kubernetes came into the ecosystem trying to solve few of or some of these problems. I will say most of these problems Kubernetes tries to solve. So Kubernetes uh, came around in July, I think June 2014, Kubernetes, the initial release of Kubernetes was uh, uh, there. And Kubernetes is trying to do the automated deployment, scaling and management of the containerized application. So that is the ecosystem that Kubernetes plays. So now you have container, how to do the deployment and how to do the management of those application. Uh, just to give you, I mean, we will not get deeper into Kubernetes uh, internals here, but just to build, build the mental model of Kubernetes, it's a very simple uh, architecture that it follows. It's a master-slave architecture that it follows. So you have a Kubernetes master, which is responsible for scheduling different workloads. So as a developer, you define that I need to run this application on my uh, Kubernetes cluster. So you make the request to the Kubernetes master, 
which somehow make sure that the workload is deployed or running on these nodes. So these are the nodes are responsible for running the actual workload and Kubernetes master is for the management of it. So we call them a control plane. So Kubernetes master is part of the control plane and these are part of the uh, data plane. So that's the terminology that we use. And all your applications are published in the, as images and those images are published in the image registry. So that's just giving you a small understanding about how Kubernetes fits in. Again, it's much more complicated than the simple diagram, but this will help you understand uh, what we are talking about. Uh, so I think we have already covered a lot of these points. So Kubernetes is all about managing a cluster of hosts. We are not talking about a single host, multiple hosts. It was built originally by Google and now it is maintained by CNCF, uh, the Cloud uh, uh, Native Computing Foundation. And first release was in June 2014. It's important to understand that Kubernetes is not something new. So it is in the ecosystem now for close to six years. So we have been, uh, it's been in active development for the last six years. And a lot of organizations have started adopting it in some shape or form. Uh, so now, since last couple of years, uh, Zebia is helping multiple organizations build their uh, Kubernetes based platform. And what we see is that there are three main key drivers that are pushing the adoption. The first is the container adoption that we just saw. Uh, so it started with platform as a service with OpenShift. Then we have Docker, Rocket, and now we have a OCI, which is the uh, container initiative, which allows you to build standard way to build a container images. Uh, now you can have multiple implementations of it. Docker is just one implementation of OCI. Uh, the second is the, I think architecture is pushing a lot. A uh, lot of the application development these days is using microservice architecture. Uh, people are moving away from monolithic to microservice architecture. So when we saw a microservice architecture, we are talking about uh, uh, building an application which is composed of smaller services and these services have their own independent life cycle. So you can have a service A which will be deployed independently of service B. So because of the microservice architecture and the complexity that it brings, you need to have an automated way to manage your deployment because now you're not talking about a single service. You're talking about a set of services. In a typical architecture, we see around 50 to 100 microservices. And finally, a lot of people want to move to multi-cloud. So they, they don't want to re rely only on AWS or Azure or Google Cloud. They want to have able ability to run on multiple cloud. And also a lot of big enterprises that we work with, they also want the capability to run the same on their private data center. So a lot of big enterprises still have the private data center. So they want that flexibility. Uh, so all of these three things in last few years have pushed the adoption of Kubernetes and I think in the last couple of years it has become it is becoming more and more mainstream. Now in a lot of organizations that we talk to we see Kubernetes adoption uh, a big thing and they are talking about how to get Kubernetes in their ecosystem and these three are the main reasons that we see. Uh, now, a lot of people ask us uh, why Kubernetes, why not Docker Swarm or something else. Uh, so there are a few other alternatives there as well. Uh, I think the first key reason here is the community adoption and innovation. A uh, lot of times it's just not about the best technology that wins. It's also about the community. It's also about the innovation that is happening in the technology. So if you look at the community uh, of Kubernetes, you will see that there are more than 4,000 organizations which are commit to Kubernetes GitHub repository, you will see a lot of developers who are contributing to it. It's one of the popular GitHub repository. And on the innovation side, it's there are so many solutions that we will talk about uh, in the later slides that are covering all the parts of the Kubernetes ecosystem. Uh, I think the second part which becomes much more important is that Kubernetes is just not for building a stateless application. I think stateless is the getting started of Kubernetes like services which are stateless, but Kubernetes also solves problem ready to build running stateful application like databases can also be run on it. 12 factor again stateless, you can easily run on Kubernetes. You can also run bad jobs on Kubernetes. So when we go to an enterprise, there is not a single workload that they want to run. They want to run all the workloads and Kubernetes has support for all of them. Uh, it is offered as a service by all the major cloud providers. So be it AWS, Azure uh, or Google Cloud, they all have the offering and other new cloud provider like Alibaba also have a Kubernetes offering. So 
the i think the friction is very low anybody who is using any of the cloud provider can start using kubernetes uh, today and i think the last part i think is more technical about kubernetes is that it's declarative in nature so when we say declarative it means that you specify what the end state that you want so if you look at the right you will see that i want to run nginx container and i want to run three copies of it i want to expose this port so you basically write this declarative file this is the end state that you want to achieve or the target state that you want to achieve and kubernetes will make sure that the state is achieved so it's declarative in nature it should use in an effective manner so that your uh, nodes are utilized properly and it offer extensible and a stable api so things that are not possible with kubernetes you can extend the api so it support custom uh, resource definition and you can write your own controllers in kubernetes so there are a lot of ways you can extend kubernetes as well uh, which is very important so any use case which is not solved right now by kubernetes you can solve it you can also write your own schedulers in kubernetes so if you are not happy with the way kubernetes is scheduling your uh, containers you can write your own scheduler as well so a lot of things are there which uh, makes kubernetes a good ecosystem to invest in uh, so in the last few years we are seeing a rapid adoption of uh, kubernetes uh, i think in january also i was in us talking to one of the big customers who were building a hybrid platform on open using open shift distribution running both on azure and in uh, uh, the private data center so as again uh, this survey is from 2018 which talks about how kubernetes is, is the number one solution when you talk about anything uh, in container ecosystem so it is uh, winning hands down and more and more organization are going the kubernetes route so now that we have spent few minutes on uh, kubernetes and by now you will have got the understanding about kubernetes ecosystem and why uh, it is leading uh, the container orchestration uh, tools i think what we really need to understand is just having kubernetes is not sufficient kubernetes is just the starting point and when we talk about platform we mean a lot of different things uh, i started working on the platform ecosystem in 2008 when google app engine was launched so google app engine allows you to run java or python applications and that was a platform as a service space that i started closely interacting with then with openshift uh, heroku and cloud foundry so if you talk to a developer they might think platform as a service is what a platform is all about but platform means different thing to different people so let's define the platform what does a platform mean uh, the simple definition of a platform is that it's something that lifts you up and on which you can stand so it's a dictionary definition of a platform that something on which you can build uh, stuff but the better definition or the definition which is relevant for this talk is uh, a digital platform is a foundation of self service apis tools services knowledge and support which are arranged as a compelling internal product so let me go over each of the uh, things that i have bold uh, i have uh, kept in bold so when we are talking about a platform it has to be a self service uh, it should provide a self service which means that developer should have the freedom to uh, ask for from it so if you have a centralized team which will be controlling it i think then you are not building a platform a platform should be self service in nature so developers don't have to interact with anyone to get uh, something out of it and it could be like i want to run an application there so i want to have a uh, two compute resources available so i should just ask the container to do that it should provide the tooling necessary to do that uh, by tooling uh, it could be how to interact with the platform like in kubernetes case it is the kube cutl or kube ctl that people use uh, it should provide the services that developer need to use when we say services so a developer just not need compute resources they also need database they also need caching they also need a message queue so a lot of services have to be provided by the platform and i think the final aspect here is you need to have a way to share the knowledge and provide the support if you want to build a platform so you need to have a platform team that can document the processes so that any developer can go and read those documents and learn about the platform and they should be available to support it by support it could be helping them out getting started it could be solving their problem helping them out solving the problem so this two aspect are important and finally at the end of the day 
platform is a compelling internal product. So it's an internal product. So you have to build the product mindset in the platform. Just running Kubernetes on a cluster is not a platform. So we will touch upon that point in a few more slides. So we talked about different uh, ways people think about platform. So what you need to understand is that there are three types of platform that we have. The first is called the offering uh, or the service platform. That is the Amazon.com, which is an e-commerce platform. Different businesses can use it to do the shipment or sell their products. So that is the offering of the service platform. The second is the digital business platform. These are the APIs. So Twitter is the API platform. So you can use the Twitter API to build new products. You can use Salesforce API. You can build Google Maps. So these are the digital business platform and they charge based on your API. And finally, we have the third platform, which is the foundation technology platform, which is the technology which provides the technology to run these things. So like AWS is the foundation technology platform. So these are three types of platforms. And uh, as you can see in this uh, uh, diagram, uh, each of them stand on top of each other, which means that if you want to have a digital business platform, you need to have a strong foundation technology platform. Uh, Kubernetes falls under foundation technology platform. So this is what we are building on, on top of Kubernetes or any other such platform. You can build your digital business. So you can build your APIs that you can expose to the uh, end users. And finally, the offering service platform, which is the end application that different uh, businesses can use. So each of them are building on top of each other. Uh, as I just talked about, Kubernetes is uh, the foundation technology platform. So it is the enabler for that. Uh, so when you think about platform, you have to think about few key principles uh, that will help you build a successful platform. This is what we have learned from our experience. Uh, first of all, as a developer platform, you, you have to create a platform which has a path of least resistance. What does it mean? It means that you can't expect your developers to learn Kubernetes. Fine, which means that how easily you can onboard them without making them learn all the concepts of it. Fine. So a lot of organizations are the organizations that we have. We have a tooling team which helps the organization, uh, which helps the end developers smoothen this process so that end developer don't have to learn a lot. Uh, developers typically want to write the functional code or the code that solves the business problem. And a lot of time platform code is the cross cutting concerns of the application. So platform has to support that so that the cognitive load on the developers is reduced. Uh, you have to enable your feature development teams to deliver with a self-service capability. We already talked about self-service. So any platform which provides meaning and has value has to have a self-service aspect in it. And finally, it should be able to, you should be able to do the right thing in the easiest possible way, which means that if you want to get the logs from error logs from your platform, it should be the one command that can help you get that information. You don't have to go through 10 commands and type that, which will make sure that which will may which might uh, developers might make mistake in it. So you really have to ensure that you you make it simple enough so that developers can do the right thing easily. And that is the key principles for building a successful platform. Uh, there are three building blocks that we see uh, when we build a platform. The first we talked about is the uh, toolbox. So toolbox is the table stakes here. So you need to have a good toolbox so that developers can use your platform. So when we say toolbox, we're talking about compute services in a self-service manner. We are talking about command line tools to interact with the tools. We are talking about better debuggability. So this is what the toolbox is all about. Then you need to have a magnet in it. When we talk about magnet means that somehow people should want to use it. Fine. Uh, this is about providing different services that developer wants to use. So if developers find it difficult to run database services, how you can make sure it is dead simple to use database services on your platform so that developers don't developers are attracted towards it because you are reducing the complexity in your platform. And finally, the matchmaker, uh, when we say matchmaker, it is not much applicable in terms of a technology platform because it is more about how you can integrate consumers from producers in a uh, in a technical uh, platform. This is not much relevant, but you can think about how you can make your platform more data driven in a way that uh, 
developers can relate the functionality that they are writing with the end business value. So once you have the key principles in mind and the building blocks, you can start thinking about building a platform. Uh, what we are realized is that uh, platform is not something which you develop and you are done with it. Fine, it is a constant process. So you really have to invest a lot of time and effort to keep it running as well as keep it improving. So in the organizations that we work with, we have a separate tooling and the platform team which ensures that the platform is kept up to date, it's patched, it's running, new features are added to it. So you really have to think about platform as a product. So when we say platform as a product, you have to ensure it is reliable. When we say reliable, you have to ensure that there's an on-call support, there's a status page, you have to have a communication channel and response time for the uh, incidents. You have to ensure it is fit for the purpose, which means that it enables quick prototyping, it, uh, it gives you regular feedback, you are iteratively improving it and you have few focused high quality services. So you don't have to support all the services in the ecosystem. You can say that we, our platform support two databases, MySQL and probably uh, MongoDB and one caching source. So you have to support few services, but they have to be high quality. And finally, you have to think about the developer experience. So when we are building platform, we also have to keep the end user in mind. In our case, the end user is the developer. Fine. So you really need to have the right level of abstractions that developers can use and which sometimes means hiding a lot of Kubernetes details underneath. Uh, and finally, uh, on the platform side, you also have to think about how you will define success criteria for the platform, which means that you have to think about the lead time of the platform, the deployment frequency, how much deployments are happening, or how much time it takes to restore the platform and how many times your platform failed. Uh, to serve the request or even in the upgrade. So you really have to keep these uh, metrics in mind. Uh, you have to take the developer satisfaction survey to understand how developers are feeling about your platform so that you can improve your platform based on that. And you have to think about the how adoption and engagement is happening. How many teams are onboarded to the platform? How many different services are being used? you will get feedback from your pla uh, from your developers on that and that will help you fine tune your platform and finally you have to define the reliability metrics where we are talking about the service level objective of the platform and the number of incidents that are happening on the platform this all can help you run a platform uh, which is stable and successful and developer want to use it uh, so one of the questions that uh, we internally discuss at ZBI is, is Kubernetes a platform or a foundation to build a platform? And uh, based on our journey so far, uh, Kubernetes has primitives which can uh, help you build a platform, but again, it does not make all the choices for you. It still leaves a lot to you. So as an organization, you really have to think about a lot of things. And just to talk about the complexity, this is what C Kubernetes ecosystem is all about. I don't expect that you will be able to read it, but you have to make a decision about the storage. You have to think about API gateway. You have to think about service mesh. Uh, you have to think about which Kubernetes distribution. You have to think about networking. You have to think about which container registry. So, and there are choices everywhere. So you need somewhat, somebody who can help you navigate this or you need to have a, a development team or a platform team who can take these decisions for you. So the ecosystem is very complex. It's just not about Kubernetes. It's about the supporting ecosystem and they all are very important. Uh, so this is very overwhelming. Uh, if you go back to the picture in the previous slide, it's very overwhelming. Uh, I think nobody knows all the services that are uh, in this ecosystem and all of these are, most of these are open source. So everything is available, but the quality of them, uh, the support of them is uh, questionable here. Uh, so it's an overwhelming uh, platform. Uh, there are a lot of choices to make and that's where organizations like Zebia play a role. Now what I will do is I will hand over to Akshay Mathur who will talk about what lessons we have learned so far in building the uh, platform. Over to you, Akshay. Thanks, Shekhar. Um, can everybody hear me fine? I hope so. No background noise or anything. Let me share my screen. <clears throat> okay. Mm. 
Okay, I assume everybody can see my screen. So here you are at Overwhelmed. Uh, what's the way forward though? So this is our approach to building an enterprise uh, Kubernetes platform. Uh, you know, the, the blueprint for how you should proceed. Um, this has been honed over time with, with our experiences with, with consulting assignments or delivery, uh, working with our customers and sort of advising them on these topics. So what we have is a step-by-step -step approach. So firstly, you need to define your platform principles. Uh, you know, what are the key objectives or the, the way that you envision your platform working and the, the capabilities that it exposes. Uh, then you obviously, you know, have to get down to the nitty gritties of things. So you have to identify the Kubernetes distribution that you will use, uh, which is vast. You saw the CNC of landscape just now from Shekhar. Uh, we'll, we'll do a little bit of zooming in into that. Um, and then since Kubernetes is not sufficient, you have to pick other essential components from that landscape, things that you will definitely need for a platform. Um, then to actually set it up, you have to consider infrastructure and operational concerns, which will be day zero through day two, for instance. Um, you have to make your organization ready because it's a big shift in uh, sort of min, uh, mindset uh, for a lot, lot of organizations. So let's see. So how do you define platform principles? That's step zero. Um, so these are sort of certain guiding uh, principles that we have come up with over time. You know, you have to design broadly, build narrow, narrowly. So because platforms are power, powerful and flexible, uh, you know, you don't want to give all the capabilities of your sort of Kubernetes clusters out to all of your developers uh, or, or, or end users. That's not the right way to do it. You kind of have to, have to figure out the abstractions that are important that teams can use and only expose those. So it's no different from, you know, for people from programming backgrounds, how you think about system design. You have to think similarly about platform design. Um, then the other big uh, problem might be if you over design things or you kind of get uh, into a certain kind of set mindset. Uh, you have to build incrementally. You have to get feedback and you have to iterate uh, because that's the that's the way every product, every software product evolves uh, and your platform, if it has to be treated as a product, has to work the same way. You need your technical POs or whoever who are, you are essentially delivering services uh, to the rest of your organization who are probably, who are in a sense, the other teams are your customers. Uh, so you have to give them what they need rather than you know, something that you might think up front. So it's it's a very agile way that you have to build this platform in. You have to build it incrementally uh, and you have to create a platform mentality. Um, and you know, Shekhar has kind of already covered what a platform is. So you have to look at it in those terms. Okay, so the diving deep down, I guess, into the Kubernetes distribution space. Um, I know there may be a few different questions about this, so we buffed up this area. Uh, we've had a lot of discussion on these uh, topics over the last few years. You know, really, you have two main choices: either you use a managed cloud offering, you know, one of the public clouds, uh, which have become very, very popular uh, as organizations sort of migrate their IT landscapes more and more to the cloud. This has become more and more of a. Uh, this has become a valuable. Uh, way to move forward uh, because if you're willing to put a bunch of other systems onto the cloud, there's no reason that your Kubernetes itself can't run in cloud. And the other one is you do a self-managed Kubernetes offering. Uh, again, this, this could be on-premise in your own data center. It could also be on the cloud. Uh, it's feasible to run your own Kubernetes clusters you know, your, by yourself uh, on, on, on a public cloud or a private cloud. Um, it requires a little bit more maturity in terms of operations. Uh, one of the themes you'll see with us is you can't leave your IT ops teams behind with this sort of building a Kubernetes, uh, build, building a platform on top of Kubernetes. They, you, they, it has to go hand in hand with them. So, well, you have to choose the right offering and there's no dearth, uh, no shortage of Kubernetes distributions. I'm sure one comes out every week. So it's just 
exaggeration. But uh, as per CNCF's, you know, the cloud native landscape, uh, if you zoom in, there are about 109 tools to manage containers, and 89% of them use some kind of flavor of Kubernetes. Uh, and that's the survey that was done, you know, in 2019, and the results just came out. So this is, these are so many, I couldn't really take a screenshot. I had to take multiple screenshots to fit them all. But as you can see, uh, every sort of major player out there, all the main businesses, you know, SAP is, is, is a business organization. They're not in the infra space, but they have a Kubernetes offering as well. Uh, and all their usual suspects have them. There are startups running managed Kubernetes for you. There are established players like Cisco. Uh, VMware has made a big push for in the space recently. Oracle, IBM, you know. Um, so yeah, go to the link sometime and try these out and you can look at some of the options there. And then there are installers if in case you want to set it up yourself. So there's hosted stuff, you know, that's managed for you. There's distributions which you can use yourself, which you can set up by hand or you can get installers. Uh, and then you have pass container services, which are slightly different. They're not really Kubernetes based. Okay. So which ones are the most popular? Uh, so as per this CNCF survey from, uh, I think this came out in March, the results of it or February. EKS is now the most popular. Um, GKE at the second number, uh, which makes sense in terms of people who were already on AWS, uh, probably found it uh, feasible to migrate easily to EKS. Uh, GKE obviously was the first, they were the first people who came out with cloud Kubernetes. Um, so yeah, no big surprise there. Um, but Docker desktop, for instance, if you see as, is at the third place, this probably indicates a trend of, this is people running it in development environments or on their laptops. And that's a sufficient, sufficiently large number of people that Docker desktop shows up here. And then you have your AKS and then QBDM cops, uh, you know, uh, Etc. are kind of used to bootstrap and manage your own clusters in cloud. Okay. Um, the advantages of a managed cloud Kubernetes as a service is how I how, how we see it. You know, in terms of having somebody else manage your cluster for you, uh, is you pay as you go. You know, this is regular cloud pricing. There's no upfront cost. You pay for what you use. You can scale up if you need it, or down if you want to save costs. Uh, you have nice cloud SLAs that AWS and Google will give you. Um, and then there's this concept of a virtual kubelet, which uh, Azure, for instance, uh, kind of facilitates through ACI, where if you have a spike in traffic, sudden burst, uh, they'll provision some serverless instances for you and add it to your cluster on the fly instead of having to have a whole node pool or spin up extra VMs. Um, so people are building a lot of cool stuff around the Kubernetes uh, ecosystem. Uh, GKE, as I understand it, is the most, still the most mature in terms of performance, etc. cetera. Um, but you know, like we saw, EKS seems to be at the top right now. Okay. How should you make that decision though? You know, uh, which cloud offering to take or which do you go on the cloud at all or not? Uh, so our take is always, uh, unless you are heavily into platforming, you know, your infrastructure provider or whatever you should just prefer to use managed Kubernetes. Uh, that's the way to go uh, because like Shekhar mentioned, uh, you want to maintain your digital platform. Do you also want to get into Kubernetes itself? Uh, so it's a, it's a bit of a trade-off. They uh, prefer to use managed uh, offerings would be our take, I think more or, more or less. But when there are other decision pointers there, you have to consider the costs of running managed services on the cloud uh, and Kubernetes has a fairly interesting pricing model on some of the cloud uh, providers. Uh, but you know, if you already have investment in, in Google Cloud or in AWS, uh, it would make more sense probably to just integrate it into the existing ecosystem, the cloud provider that you're currently using. But then you have to consider the, you know, this is where the platform aspects come in. Uh, what are the capabilities that your platform needs to support? Uh, are those supported by by the Kubernetes uh, service that that the cloud provider is giving you? You know, uh, one are the services available in your region? More or less, sure, but you know there is a in certain regions there is a cap on sort of the amount of compute that the cloud providers can provision for you. Let me, yeah. Do you have to worry about HE configurations, etc.? This gets a little bit technical, but your sort of Kubernetes masters should never run in single mode. 
So you have to worry about do, do they have the proper sort of uh, HA stuff uh, out of the box or is it tough to set up? Um, but then you may have data and compliance regulations. This is a big one. Uh, I think banks, for instance, can't, you know, a, a lot of them you know, are now successfully migrating to the cloud, but there are certain workloads they can't easily put onto the public cloud, for instance, because there are lots, all sorts of financial data regulations to worry, worry about. Uh, and then certain, certain companies may have special storage requirements or something, which maybe is not on the cloud. You want your own custom hardware, whatever. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then, um, you know, a, a point about the special workload, uh, for instance, uh, we've talked to people who want to run Oracle, you know, the Oracle database in Kubernetes, but it's it's not really supported properly yet, apart from maybe in, I mean, Oracle's Kubernetes engine. Uh, yeah. So you have to kind of identify the right self-service distribution, you know, the one that will uh, help you to build up your platform. Um, you can go with a vanilla open source Kubernetes distribution, um, but you know what we've seen is a lot of enterprises go with OpenShift. So uh, what is OpenShift? OpenShift container platform is uh, the Red Hat kind of came out with this fairly early. Uh, Shekhar knows more about this than I do, but uh, essentially it's built on top of vanilla Kubernetes. They have built in a lot of their sort of mature experience working within the enterprise space their their understanding of the kind of security and compliance requirements enterprises have you know so it's an opinionated pass as you could call it a platform as a service built on top of kubernetes uh, it actually extends the kubernetes abstractions a little bit and gives gives its own sort of api abstractions but it's a full platform solution you can just once you've implemented it it uh, enables your development teams it enables your release cycles uh, you know it ties in well with your uh, Active Directory, et cetera, your role-based access, everything. Uh, you know, it gives you everything out of the box. Uh, and the current version basically runs itself is how Red Hat sees it uh, in, in terms of you need very, very little uh, sort of manual operational toil there. Uh, it just upgrades itself in the background. Uh, but, and it's, it's very, very tightly integrated in the current version. Um, they are using the Red Hat Core OS now. Uh, you know, they don't even use Docker anymore. Uh, the, uh, and the whole thing basically runs itself. Um, there are a few different options there though. One is you could, if you wanted, uh, sign up with Red Hat for a online uh, Red OpenShift uh, service on, on one of the public clouds. AWS, for instance, is well supported. Uh, so is Azure. Uh, and that sort of leads into your hybrid model as well. If you want to run on multiple clouds and on-prem, you could just take a sort of combined package from Red Hat. Uh, and I promise this is not a pitch for Red Hat, by the way. Uh, it's just that this is one that we see getting a lot of traction. Uh, but if you're worried about sort of sharing infrastructure, you could get a dedicated online tenant, uh, but, and also you can set it up on-prem. So there is some kind of way to get to a hybrid model here, you know, both on-premise and cloud together. It, it is essentially the market leader in terms of this on-premise container landscape, as far as I can tell. Anybody who doesn't want to build and figure out their own Kubernetes platform, typically might go with OpenShift. Uh, it has a lot of security baked in as well, you know, which enterprises typically need. Okay. Um, what, you know, th then there are some other options, you know, Canonical, the people behind Ubuntu, give you managed Kubernetes clusters, uh, you know, on all of the clouds, on OpenStack, you know, even on top of VMware, etc. So that's a pretty decent option. Um, I would assume. Uh, then there's Rancher. Rancher has something called RKE, which is open source, but they kind of give you, you know, Kubernetes as a service. Utilizing that, they actually have a distribution for edge computing as well, which is more lightweight. Uh, there are a lot of uh, players in this space now. Um, you know, there's uh, one that I met recently with somebody called Locomotive, uh, and these guys, what they've done is they've made a self-hosted Kubernetes uh, which doesn't even use one of these other flavors of Linux because your containers have to run some kind of Linux. So because Core OS kind of got subsumed within Red Hat, they came up with Flatcar Container Linux uh, and they sort of drive that project and they've built Locomotive on top of it. It's self-hosted in that in terms of everything is a container, you know, even your sort of internal uh, Kubernetes components down to the kubelet, etc. It's all containers and it's uh, it has a lot of security inbuilt into it. Um, the uh, other one to consider is Google has been pushing Anthos for a while now, which is sort of Google's big push into the enterprise IT environment. Um, 
it, it is hybrid. Uh, you get one single control plane uh, from which you can manage your cloud and on-prem clusters. Excuse me. And it, you know, one of the nice things it does is it essentially treats your clusters like cattle as well. If you have a VMware vSphere, which is what it runs on, it can set up new clusters very, very easily for you, uh, allow you to do cluster auto scaling. Uh, VMware has made a big push recently, you know, with come up with Tanzu, but they always had sort of PKS uh, as well. Um, and, you know, even SAP has gotten into the game, which is very interesting. Um, so now having gone through those, uh, you know, sort of distributions, that's fine. But as we talked about, um, you know, that's that's an implementation detail in a sense, uh, right? That's just basic Kubernetes. Uh, what do you really need if you want to build up a platform? So this is how we see it. Uh, this is sort of ZBS reference slide for a lot of our Kubernetes related engagements. Um, every time we talk to a customer, we update this to sort of build different kind of solutions on top. And, and you know, we feel like this encapsulates everything you might need in a Kubernetes platform. Uh, plus it's cloud agnostic. So if you wanted to say, okay, have this stack on a cloud, you just switch components in and out and it would just work fairly well. You know, you have your source control, you have uh, some kind of registry, you know, typically it's a Docker registry because Docker is so widely used, but uh, you know, you could replace this with Nexus or, 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 or Harbor, which is a CNC of certified registry project now, or Quay, you know, you plug in any, anything else. Uh, this is going left to right. Uh, and then typically you might start with Jenkins because most people have Jenkins, but you could switch it in for Jenkins X. Um, nowadays, people are recommending that, uh, you know, you use something like Argo CD or Spinnaker is become fairly Kubernetes compliant now for your, all of your deployment needs because it gives you a lot of smart deployment sort of pre-baked stuff. Um, and then this diagram has Istio as a service mesh to govern east-west traffic concerns. Uh, you could replace that with Linkerd if you wanted to. Um, and if you're sort of setting up a platform from scratch, you might need an SSO provider, uh, and there are a lot of those solutions in the market as well now. Um, and then if you're on AWS, you'll just use the S3, but if you want your own object storage, you can use something like Minio, um, and you can run, you know, get this similarly. It's a fairly similar stack to what AWS, uh, sorry, Open OpenShift provides you, uh, you know, pre-baked pre into their solution. Uh, so it has a lot of the similar components, and Typically, you'd have Vault uh, to integrate secrets management. You can have Redis for caching, uh, and then you have the sort of base platform components of monitoring and distributed tracing, etc. Okay. So moving on. Um, so yeah, this is just the same stuff, but more. You know, you want aggregated logging. You'd go with Elastic, but there are other solutions out now. Uh, people are coming up with their own sort of aggregated logging solutions as well. You could integrate it with Splunk, for instance. You want centralized monitoring in this space. We've kind of seen Prometheus, the Prometheus operator as sort of uh, the forerunner. We like it a lot as well, so it seems to work very, very well for us uh, across most of our engagements. Jagger is sort of the de facto for distributed tracing now. Um, the other thing you need to worry about is uh, performance. Uh, you need to tune performance at all levels because what we've seen is uh, it may not just be application performance. Uh, you may have to deal with the same stuff that you deal with in the pre Kubernetes world, which is sort of, well, I, are my packets getting through, you know, sort of the net TCP connections, you worry about networking and all of that. And then because you're essentially sharing infrastructure in a more secure way, you have to worry about setting resource constraints and limits. So some applications can't hog all of the compute from the others. So you have to build governance practices around it. Uh, and then you ideally have to set SLOs and SLIs, uh, you know, based on that to say, well, my service needs to have this kind of performance characteristic and correspondingly, this platform needs to have this kind of uptime. Um, so you have to worry, uh, worry about building in all of this support because your uh, development teams are not going to have worry about this. Uh, they, the, the cognitive overhead of that would be too much. So they can only build their services in, in a compliant manner which you have to publish to them, prescribe to them. Uh, but the platform itself has to kind of handle all of this. Uh, and then you worry about scalability, you worry about security at multiple levels, along with sort of identity integration. Um, you make deployments very easy. Uh, and then, you know, the big one is for us now is developer experience. I think we are 
everybody is sort of far enough into the cycle now to agree that fine, uh, we figure out deployment to production, but the developer experience on Kubernetes is something that's it's in, it's in a state of evolution. A lot of people are investing effort into this space now with tools like telepresence or tilt, etc. Um, yeah. So the other, you know, so once you've kind of identified the components of your platform, the stuff that you will absolutely need to have in it, you have to worry about operational concerns. You know, how will you set up your cluster? You know, will you use COPS, QBDM, which is default, which is kind of tough to work with. This is this happens when you set up your own cluster instead of using a managed cluster. You do something like Cube Spray, but it's a little bit slow. Uh, and then each of the managed offerings, you know, EKS gives you EKS CTL, for instance. Um, you have to worry about your, you know, this is something uh, with OpenShift. OpenShift kind of gives you pre-baked container images as well. So you don't worry about it, but if you want to build this stuff up yourself, you have to worry about, okay, what will my base image be? Uh, how will it get hardened and get security patches automatically? Uh, you have to worry about storage network, you know, all of the operational stuff. You have to still worry about it. How will it tie in into your cluster? Because Kubernetes is nice, it gives you pluggable abstractions, uh, but at the back of it, you still need to worry about what is your storage model? What is your networking model? What kind of security do you want to enforce? You have to worry about the kinds of workloads, which then factors in into, okay, what would my node sizing look like? And what would my cluster size look like? Okay, and then you have to worry about the Kubernetes related stuff. You know, how do you get traffic into the cluster? Maybe have an API gateway, there are about 10 of those. Uh, we've even played around with using Istio as an API gateway. Um, you have to worry about which service mesh, uh, and do you want to, uh, so govern egress traffic as well and then kubernetes security is its own topic but you know part security policies uh, you know are back authentication authorization uh, and this stuff should all you know your developer development team shouldn't need to worry about stuff this should be part of the platform so you have to figure all of these things out as part of your platforming you have to make your organization ready um, you really have to kind of uh, you know, there's a quotation from somebody who said that they brought in you know, Kubernetes as a platform, you know, sort of core of the platform because they wanted to transform the organization. Uh, you have to start organizing your teams in terms of, you know, SLAs uh, and then service level objectives and what are the SLIs for that. So your platform has SLAs, your service teams have SLAs, um, and then the relationship is very much sort of provider consumer kind, you know, as, as Shekhar said, it's a product now. It's an internal product which the rest of your organization uses. Um, now, if the problem is you have to have discipline around this, um, you know, you can't just have people calling up the platform team and saying, well, this is not working the way I wanted it. You have to specify boundaries and abstractions so that they can work autonomously with minimal coordination. But then when they have issues, it's easy to reach out and get them resolved. So you need self-service portals. Uh, you need to find a balance. This, I think, is one of those big cash 22s people are struggling with do you have more silos this happens with microservices as soon as those they came under do you have too many silos or do you have extensive centralization you need to find a good balance with automation the one thing you have to do is all this manual ticketing workflow you know too many emails phone calls that approach just won't scale you know as you scale out that approach won't scale with you you have to sort of abandon that and bring in more and more automation Okay, um, so these are some of the lessons that we've learned, you know, over time, uh, going through this process a few times. Uh, oh, and these some of these are fairly technical, but you know, uh, ideally, because you want zero time downtime upgrades, you want constant patching upgrades. Kubernetes releases a new version, you know, every three months or so, every quarter, and essentially, uh, so you can't take downtime for every time you want to patch your cluster or upgrade it. So you have to figure out smart ways to, you know, you have to find the right tools to set up your cluster so you can then keep your clusters upgraded all the time. And, you know, this is, uh, there's another quote out there which says your cluster is not your pet. Don't treat it as a, it, it's a cattle, you know. If one day your cluster goes down, uh, you should have declarative configuration which can just spin up 10 more clusters uh, without you having to lift a finger. It should just be like that. Um, so you have to build all of that support in uh, one of those that we found is don't run binaries, run everything as a container. Uh, you, know. uh, you have to worry about security. Uh, you know, we've been through all of the CIS benchmarks when you do it yourself. Uh, and this this is pretty, there's a path to doing this in today's world. Um, so it's not as challenging. 
um, you have to apply stuff like admission control webhooks so that uh, people can't just deploy any kind of workload. You know, you you curtail the amount of compute, etc., that a particular workload can get uh, right as when the request gets submitted to Kubernetes. Um, and then uh, fun that was sort of a pain point for me for for some time, which was don't think you can get away with a single master cluster. You can't. You know, even for a lower dev environment, you should have a multi master HA setup. Okay, uh, then you have to worry about day two operations, you know, monitoring and uh, logging, etc. should just work. Ideally, you should only have to interact with it through dashboards and alerts, you know, have, have proper SRE style dashboards, have proper traceability in place. Um, um, we, we actually put in you know, Kager, Kiali, we've scoped everything, uh, you know, at times just as, as microservices sort of stateless workflow interaction gets more and more complex, you need more and more tracing around. Um, and then ideally you need timely support, you know, for platform services. Uh, this is very, very important. If people want to, you know, as Shekhar said, if you want to act as a magnet, right, then you need to give really, really good service. You know, the, essentially start to approach QoS kind of things, right? Quality of service. Uh, so clear response time, service status pages, communication channels, etc. Okay. Um, and then you have the developer experience part, which has become fairly important. This this is a pain point I, uh, we understand for a lot of people. Uh, you, you don't want your developers to write their own Helm charts or whatever, you know, 10 files of YAML for one service. Uh, that's sort of the wrong model for it. Uh, so you want self-service portals. You want a GitOps model. Um, you know, uh, your ops ideally should not be manual. You shouldn't need to go SSH into a node or something, kill a pod or whatever. It should all be a fully automated via PR merges, drive everything through source control. That's that's a big model nowadays. Um, provide build packs. Again, something that you get with some of these managed solutions. You know, uh, even AWS gives you some stuff for this. You provide code build packs and templates. So there's, you know, there's no not a one size fits all approach. You provide different templates. You know, if you want to run a cron job or you want to run a stateful you know, set or whatever, you have a template in place for it, which people can just use, uh, which which can be supported by your platform team. Um, and then this sort of, you know, observability, logging, metric stuff, your dev development teams shouldn't have to build that in themselves. It should be baked in into a deployment pipeline. Uh, they shouldn't have to write YAML, frankly, it should just be able to specify the configuration that they need. Um, during initial stages of sort of when you set up a new LOB or whatever, uh, you need to collaborate closely because that's where you can hash out, okay, here are the requirements from this sort of suite, business suite for this platform that we have. Uh, can this platform support it? No, you know, how much time will they take to support it? And then it's very easy, easy to roll out your new applications on top of it. Uh, and then the last one is sort of, you know, not everybody can release to production five times a day, but you should find good ways to decouple release from deployments because it's going on to a cloud platform or, or on a Kubernetes platform. Your developers need faster feedback, right, from, from the proper, you know, de production-like deployment scenario. So you know, look into dark launches, canary releases kind of things, which is fairly doable with with a digital platform and with service meshes, etc. Um, the one thing your developers shouldn't do is build their own sort of solutions of, okay, maybe I will implement my own Kubernetes operator for this particular application. That shouldn't happen. Should be very much a sort of service delivery kind of model. Um, you know, uh, right. So one of the things, you know, even Kelsey Hightower, for instance, has said that uh, Kubernetes should be a hidden implementation detail, you know, of your change management system. The rest of your organization should not need to care, to care that the platform has Kubernetes underneath it. Um, right, so this is, I think, is the thought we'd like to uh, stop on. You know, make sure you need Kubernetes cloud scale in the first place. It's not inexpensive to operate, uh, you know, stuff on top of Kubernetes. Um, so if you don't need the scale, and it is complex, uh, if you don't need the scale, um, you know, might not be worth replatforming completely. Um, and be sure about, your, you know, how much scale you want. You know, solutions designed for 500 engineers different from something that a team for 50 needs and it's different from something that a team of five needs. Yeah. OK, those are our Twitter handles. Uh, in case you have any questions later, you can reach out to us on those. OK, I guess that's all we have for the presentation.
so thanks everyone for listening. So we have few questions, so I will spend few minutes going over the questions that we have received. Uh, so this is Shekhar speaking. Uh, so the first question that we have received is, is container infrastructure the right place to create big data platform or are they good enough for running mobile or web application? So for big data platform, if you have to run compute, I think that's totally fine. If you have Spark jobs running in uh, Azure container, AKS or EKS, totally fine. You can do that. We still think that stateful workloads still need to be more mature. Uh, so we still don't see a lot of organization running Oracle or any other database in the uh, uh, in the Kubernetes ecosystem, but it will mature over time. So I think that what we have right now. So mobile and web applications totally uh, for big data. Any compute job that you have, you can still run on top of Kubernetes. So that we see uh, everywhere. The second question is, can we get the presentation? Yes, you can. We will share that. Uh, OpenShift work as same as Kubernetes. So OpenShift is one of the Kubernetes distribution as uh, Akshay just talked about. So uh, it's it provides a lot of goodies on top of Kubernetes. So it's more hardened and provide a lot of other functionalities on top of Kubernetes, but underneath it is Kubernetes. Which containers are being used by uh, AWS? So containers could be, I think it could be Docker. It doesn't really matter here which containers. I think it can run Docker as well. It can run Rocket as well. So. It, I think it, it, it is uh, so AWS is the cloud platform, so you can either run virtual machines, you can run containers, you can run anything. So I don't think it is very important. Uh, uh, how Kubernetes has an upper hand over Docker. So Docker and Kubernetes are solving two different problems. So Kubernetes use Docker underneath for containers. So like uh, you will have uh, Kubernetes at the end is managing Docker containers. So Docker so Docker is two things. One is the container that it provides. It also has its own Docker swarm, which is the container orchestration solution. So where it competes with Kubernetes. But as we understand, uh, Kubernetes has already won that space. So lot, not many people are using Docker swarm. Uh, uh, can we write our own scheduling algorithm in Kubernetes? Yes, you can. Uh, so it has a simple Go API and you can write your own. I think you don't even have to write in Go. You can write in Java as well. I tried that in Java, so you can. Uh, is it necessary to learn Docker before learning Kubernetes? Yes, I think you need to understand container basic before you can uh, you can uh, Kubernetes because at the end of the day you are managing uh, containers. So Kubernetes can be used to design our own platform as service. Yes, uh, that's the answer. Uh, as a business owner, what do I really need to know about? Kubernetes if I already have my business migrated over AWS. So I think you really have to understand whether you need those capabilities or not. Uh, I think that you really have to uh, understand. Uh, you have to understand if there is any limitation that you're hitting with uh, Kubernetes, uh, with AWS right now. So how is your team using AWS? Because if you're using the traditional way of using AWS, you might be spinning up virtual machines manually or you might not have a lot of automation there. So Kubernetes can hide a lot of these things as well as Kubernetes will give you the freedom to move beyond AWS. So tomorrow you want to move from AWS to Azure, you can do that. Uh, I think that what we have. Uh, so I think these are the few questions that we received. I think uh, we can end here. Monish, over to you. Sure. Uh, thank you so much, audience, for joining us. And uh, we have another amazing webinar scheduled for tomorrow. Uh, please join us again at 2 p.m. Uh, we'll be uh, we will have Lawrence De Jong giving a talk on Google Cloud. So till then, uh, we'll take your leave. Thank you so much, and we'll uh, provide you the recording for the webinar by today evening. And also, we'll send you a feedback survey. Hope you fill that. Thank you so much.